bear with me just a second, guys. Seem to be having some technical difficulties, which isn't the biggest surprise on earth, is it? Really? So, um, I've kind of thrown a curveball out there tonight. I've lived quite the life, and um, I've considered throwing some of this crazy biographical stuff out there in the past. Um, partly because, you know, people will ask me questions every now and then, and I, I also just sort of pick up on some confusion because, um, you know, there's some uh, sort of contradictory uh, elements to my personality, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm a bit rough around the edges for someone who... Um, I don't like to think of myself as a spiritual teacher, but I certainly talk about stuff that could fall under that category. And I, you know, I'm an ayahuasca facilitator and helping people to heal a lot, but then a bit rough and tumble. So what's up with that? What's up with that is um, a whole lot of gnarly shit uh, in my childhood. And this is how you end up, um, you know, as a, being a healer, uh, a leader, um, when that's appropriate, you know, and I'm sort of, in some ways, I'm, I'm thankful that I had such extreme experiences as a, as a young kid, um, because it did leave me with a certain level of fearlessness, I guess. Um, although, you know, I, I have to wonder, um, I don't know, I wonder a lot of things, you know, um, <laughs> And you know, with this title about the inbred murderers in my in my neighborhood, this is not a joke. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, it's literally true, and I'll I'll definitely um, explain um, some of that. Uh, I, I'm considering just you know doing the, the a whole uh, biographical, uh, maybe just a few live streams or something because my early years, man, a lot of stuff happened. Um, and it was sort of a perfect storm of being right outside of Washington, D.C., um, sort of where there were still some remnants of the old hillbillies from West Virginia. Um, but the gentrification um, was sort of creeping in and swallowing up this area. And so... You know, I, I lived around like literally some of the wealthiest, most powerful people on the planet. You know, my best friend in high school, his his dad was the CEO of Exxon Mobil until he had to um, retire early because of a stroke. Um, and you know that like a girl down the street from my house, uh, she rode the same bus as me even. Um, Schwarzenegger and Reagan came over for dinner when I was in second grade, you know, in the show and tell uh, was the girl from my neighborhood's like, my mamma shot my papa in the ass last night. And then the girl from a mile down the road has got pictures of Schwarzenegger and Reagan at her house for dinner, you know? Um, and so it was this crazy, uh, dichotomy of like this absolute bottom of the barrel redneck, not even redneck. I mean, we're so far beyond redneck at this point. Um, you know, that, that just doesn't do it any justice. The people in my neighborhood were illiterate. They were violent. They were addicted to drugs. Um, I don't even know how many murders I either witnessed or, you know, can't, like one of my came up on it afterwards, at, like right after the fact. Um, by the sixth grade, you know, definitely uh, quite a few of them. Um, so, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about exactly where to start. So let's, let's begin at the beginning, I guess. I, um, my earliest memories are from this log cabin that I lived in with my mother in, um, Front Royal, Virginia, which is like in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, really nice, quaint little town. It, you know, it was overwhelmingly positive memories. I have no idea where my dad was, uh, but I have not one single memory of him, um, uh, being there during this time. Um, and so one day we left and I remember we went to, uh, my grandmother's house and lived there with them, um, for maybe a few years. I don't really recall. I was really young, um, at this point. Uh, but then my mom got pregnant with my little brother. And so they decided that we needed to go get a house. 
And so they found one in, on this, this, in this neighborhood, Pokal Drive. Um, Pokal Drive, right? I mean, it even sounds like there would be cars up on cinder blocks and, you know, the cops not showing up because they're scared of the neighbors. This actually happened. We'll get there. Um, but, you know, and another thing to consider about this uh, is I mentioned all these murders, right? This was all in my neighborhood. My neighborhood was a quarter mile one street <laughs> okay so when i'm talking about multiple homicides i'm talking about you know less than two dozen homes um but we're getting ahead of ourselves so uh, when we moved in it was we had no running water we had um no heat none of that I, I can actually remember waking up with my uh blankets frozen to the wall and my mom having to like peel me out of this like iceberg bed and pull the crusty frozen you know the like ice off of the unpeel it to get me out um and there were bullet holes in the window um and the previous residents had been driven out of the neighborhood by the um neighbors but not before they killed their daughter uh by throwing i guess a molotov cocktail through the window and burning down uh what i later discovered to be my bedroom and um you know it's one of like two ghost stories that i have i actually found this out because i had a friend sleep over and um we, I was trying to go to sleep and I could hear like this sobbing coming from the closet. And I was like, man, what is that? You know, and my friend I thought was asleep. So, you know, I'm just like laying there, like what in the hell? And I kind of peered out over the side of the bed and I could see this sort of like translucent outline of a little girl sobbing in the corner. And, um, so the, the crazy thing about all that is that it turned out that my room had burned most of the way down and the little girl was killed in there. Um, and my friend who was sleeping on the floor mentioned the sobbing and the little girl to me like a week later or something. I think we were like nine years old or something when that happened. So pretty crazy, you know, I mean, unbelievably, um, poor, um, there was, I, I remember at one point our, um, water was tested for safety and it had concrete and fecal matter in it amongst other things. Um, Gosh, man. Uh, so, um, my my neighbors, I guess, two houses up were testaments, right? I don't know if I should be using these people's real names, but I am. Um, and then across the street were the Innises, and then down on the other corner were more testaments. And I remember being maybe like ten or or somewhere around that age and this kid that I knew started talking about his aunt and his mom and sister and you know it was like the Innises and the Testermans and um you know and I it, it hit me I wish I could remember the exact details but you know this kid was literally talking about his sister mom and their, you know, uncle dad down the road or whatever, like, and, and, you know, it hit me, these people are like literally inbred. They're literally inbred. And, um, you know, you could see it. They were illiterate. A lot of them, they had pit bulls that they would feed gunpowder to. And these, um, pit bulls actually occasionally would escape and they formed like a big pack of like killer dogs that had, you know, been basically tortured into being mean their entire lives, um, that would chase people and kill all of our, you know, all of our cats would always, you'd hear this screaming in the front yard of cat getting ripped to shreds and we'd have to get more cats and animal control would round them up. And the, I mean, it was, I, it, it, that was, that was some crazy shit. The, just the loose pack of killer dogs in the neighborhood. Um, so uh, one of the families, they were like lumberjacks. Um, they were all like six foot six ish, including the 13 year old girl. 
Oh, th that was the Jenkins. The Jenkins were um, also bred into the Ennises across the street. Uh, that I remember both families really liked plastic um, uh, lawn ornaments. They had like, you know, plastic flamingos and velvet Elvises. They actually had velvet Elvises all through their hallway. Um, and so uh, Tammy, um, the, the, the daughter, was probably pushing 300 pounds uh, in eighth grade and uh, made my life absolutely a living hell. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that um, for about a year. Uh, my life was in danger. Uh, I mean, th these people were fucking crazy. You know, don't, don't get it fucked up. Um, so let's, let's go through like some of the incidents with these families, I guess, one at a time. Uh, oh my God. So, um, the first homicide, I guess, um, involved my, my babysitter who I guess I was probably like eight or nine. Um, she was 16 years old. Uh, and her, her brother, um, killed a kid before that happened though, a few weeks before, uh, Bobby stabbed this kid to death in the neighbor's front yard. Um, I was outside playing and I heard pap, 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 which turned out to be, uh, my babysitter walking down the street shooting at a bunch of guys that were beating her brother with lead pipes in the driveway of my friend's house across the street. So, um, next to the neighbors who, the biker gang woman who used to have sex with her pit bulls, um, that, that you can't forget about those people. They were, they were wonderful. Uh, so, so after Bobby recovers from getting beaten half to death with uh, lead pipes in his front yard, or in, yeah, in my friend's front yard, um, he decides that he's high on PCP and he decides that he's going to challenge um, this football star. Kid was, you know, straight A's, football scholarship, 18 years old, on his way to Ivy League. You know what I mean? Just like the quintessential all-American football star on his way to do amazing things and whatever. And uh, Bobby decided that he was going to race this guy to the 7-Eleven down the road, and the kid said no thanks, and so he didn't even try to race, and then Bobby waited for him at the, um, at the, at the, the place and he said um uh you know you you owe me a hundred bucks or whatever it was the kid wouldn't pay him so they chased him back to my neighborhood bobby ran him off the road in the testerman's front yard and at this time i was you know i was maybe eight or nine years old and i was sitting around at home um actually i i might have been a little bit older because i'm pretty sure it was the day before my first day of um, sixth grade, and I, I was excited because I was going to be a sixth grader. Uh, and um, so I asked my mom if I could go for a bike ride, and uh, I uh, made it down to the end of the road, and the cops had already started to show up. There was a helicopter flying over, and... Um, I, they must have just arrived because the Testerman girl's grandfather was shoving towels into the holes in this kid. Um, he was butchered. Uh, absolutely insane. And I, I remember Bobby got uh, one to ten years, which still to this day just blows my mind. Um, that he could just murder this kid and get so little time because the judge said because he was high on PCP um, that uh, he, he wasn't in his right mind and they were lenient on him. Um, which was pretty remarkable. And then so um, that old man, right, that was stuffing the towels into this, this kid, um, he's the one... <laughs> 
who, uh, when I was in second grade, so this is like years earlier, how these people were allowed to stay together is totally beyond me. But he's the one that got shot in the ass by his wife, right? Um, holy shit, man. He, uh, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. But this is literally, literally a second grade show and tell. And this is like normal fare for this neighborhood and these people. Um, my, I haven't even looked at the chat because it's like taking so much focus to... So I apologize if anybody's had anything to say. Um, this gets crazier, you guys. Before the story is over, the lead singer from Guar, because uh, he lived right around the corner from me, makes an appearance. Dave Grohl from Nirvana lived in my dad's basement. Um, I was charged with uh, the the highest um, drug drug charge of any juvenile in the history of the justice system. Um, conspiracy to run a continual criminal enterprise. Uh, RICO charges. Uh, the biggest manhunt in like northern, I was like 13 years old. I mean, and that's not got anything to do with the, the rednecks and whatnot. But man, this, this story does, and it's, it's difficult for me to tell it because I'm trying to stick to the inbred rednecks and the murderers. And my eventual graduation to, you know, organized crime as like a preteen, basically. Um, you know, these are all kind of separate separate stories i guess although they do kind of link up together uh in various ways but um so where were we were talking about yeah okay so uh the girl from down the road so this is like the structure of this right we lived on pokal drive which was like this one strip of inbred pcp smoking you know i mean my dad's friends were like named shit like bones you know and they had like three teeth and and they were always smoking PCP and uh, fighting and stabbing each other. And they'd always just got, you know what I mean? Just total white trash. Um, but by the time I left, the rich people had started buying up the neighborhoods. So there was only like eight houses left or something by the time we uh, moved away. Um, and so it was Fairfax County. And Fairfax County is the second wealthiest per capita um, or at least it was at the time. I don't know about now, but um, second wealthiest per capita in the entire nation. So it was just this one street of like inbred hillbillies. Uh, and then we were surrounded by like, you know, Redskins players, politicians, ambassadors from other countries, CIA employees. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, CEOs of all kinds of giant mega corporations that had their headquarters in Quantico or, or uh, Crystal City or, or Washington, D.C., um, which, by the way, was the murder capital of the world at the time. This was like at the, the, the peak of the crack epidemic was like right around this period. So that was starting to kind of mix in with um, these rich kids, too. And so, you know, the formula for me basically to uh, come from the sort of white trash violence anyways and then we were right outside of dc but gangster rap had made being like dangerous and selling drugs and being violent cool so we had all these rich kids with like ten thousand dollar a week allowances that could buy drugs wholesale and guns and so um so yeah i mean if you think this is bad so far you just hang in there put your seatbelt on and wait because um holy shit uh so, so anyways, that's the mixing bowl of Fairfax County, right? That's this crazy, um, shit storm, uh, basically in the early nineties, I guess this would have been late eighties, early nineties. And so, uh, this girl from down the street, um, you know, show and tell is where everyone goes around and everyone has a story or they have something to show. Um, and so the girl from, this is literally one mile these two girls lived, like one mile apart. Um, the girl from the wealthy neighborhood down the road, you know, has got a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ronald Reagan with her dad and mom and her at her house for dinner. And then they get to the girl next to me from my neighborhood, and she literally just says, my mamma shot my papa right in the ass last night. And it was true. I heard the shot. Like, um, I was wondering who, who it was. <laughs> but so the old man that was stuffing the towels on the kid, his wife shot him in the ass when I was in second grade. Um, 
Man, and you know, you guys, I'm gonna warn you, they, these stories are not gonna get any nicer. I'm gonna just, you know, the whole graphic craziness of it, I'm just uh, putting it all out there. It's gonna, it's, you know, so um, you've been warned. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, it is, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, why I think I'm telling the story because I know I have a tendency to like laugh at, um, like, you know, terrible things that people are horrified by. Uh, and it's just so, it's like nothing to me really, you know, and I, maybe it's a, maybe it's a coping mechanism or something, but I realize that, you know, people that don't understand my background probably don't know what to think of some of the things that I'll do or say, uh, you know, just, um, yeah. So, uh, let's see what happened next. Um, oh, well then there's the time I found a dead body in the pond. Uh, there was this trail that went out to this pond that had enormous bass in it. It was, it was a great fishing spot and it was way out in the middle of the woods. Um, and, at some point, I was, I, I don't remember if, I think it was maybe Bobby, the guy that, that stabbed the kid to death. Um, he stole a car and took it somehow, drove it way back to that pond back there in the forest, uh, like almost to the pond. I don't know how the hell the car made it, uh, but he stashed the car back there and then he had a buddy with him. So I guess that kid wasn't the only person that Bobby killed. Um, and so... I had heard about the car getting stolen. I knew something was going on. The cops had been around the neighborhood the day before. Um, and so, uh, and so I went out to go fishing. And when I got to the pond, I noticed that there was a fishing pole. I guess steal a car, go out to the pond, go fishing. I don't know what the hell these guys are doing, but um, so there's a broken fishing pole handle and it's got some blood on it and there's some blood on the ground. And so I, I see, um, some boot marks in the mud and stuff. And I follow them around to the other side of the pond and there's a big pile of sticks in the pond and there's two boots sticking up from, um, underneath of the sticks. Uh, so I just left. I never said anything about it um, to anyone. I, I didn't, uh, you know, you don't, you don't do that. You don't do that. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I just went home and I know they recovered the car. Um, but I never heard anything about that body. And I just always wondered, you know, if they went back and got it and moved it or something because it was not hidden, um, very well. Uh, or what, you know, and I actually can remember, um, my line of sight on the bank, it was kind of steep and the other half of the fishing pole was laying, like he broke it and then chased the guy, I'm assuming around the pond, beating him with it or something. And, um, and then you could see where there was, he had slid down the bank and landed in the pond and they covered him up with brush and, um, Yeah, so there was that. I was probably like, I don't know, 10 years old or something when that happened. Um, so uh, the neighbor, Mr. Hall, uh, he had no teeth um, and he was somehow bred into all of these people around us. Um, exactly the web of inbreeding, I'm not entirely sure. But I remember um, one day I was out in the front yard and I had just gotten a saxophone and I was out like playing the saxophone and he was always super drunk. Mr. Hull was his name. And I remember he came out and he's like, play those A, E, I, O's and U's boy. Because I guess he thought that vowels were the notes in the scale. Um, that was kind of funny. The, Mr. Hall, uh, not very interesting other than that um, story. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, um, the lumberjack, uh, they, and this is where it starts getting really bad, you guys. Um, so don't, you know, I, I warned you. 
um, he stopped into my mother, my mother's work one day. She was running a nursery and, um, he had to buy a bunch of stuff. And so he hands my mom a blank check and he says, ma'am, could you just go ahead and fill my name in and sign it for me? Because I can't read nor write. So this dude was like literally handing people blank checks and just asking them to fill it in because he couldn't read or write. Um, which is cute. Uh, so, all right. So, um, things really started to take a bad turn for me because my mother didn't want to associate with the rednecks in the neighborhood. Uh, she felt like it was best to not, you know, to ignore their invitations to uh, parties and, um, and get togethers and stuff. And that was not good because what actually ended up happening is that they were like, oh, so you think you're better than us? You snotty, what do they call us? They had names for us, I, re I remember, but I don't, uh, you know, just like we were stuck up, you know, and thought we were better than them. We were better than them. Uh, we, you know, I can't remember the last time that we fed uh, gunpowder to our dogs or raped our sister, which happened. Um, this girl that I'm about to relate this story, uh, her, she was part of this lumberjack family, and um, right before we left, she was gang raped by all of her brothers. Um, so, yeah, that happened. Um, man, and then there was the serial killer in the neighborhood, but let's get through this Jenkins story. So, um, at some point, uh, they started jumping me and my brother, but particularly me because I was bigger. Uh, and almost always in groups. Um, so my mother enrolled us in uh, Taekwondo. And I don't know that it really did a whole ton of good, except that it built up my confidence and I started to win all these fights. Right? So Tammy Jenkins decides that she is going to tell all of the scariest people, all of her redneck inbred brothers all of the I was in seventh grade so she told all the eighth graders in my school that I said I could beat up any one of them at any time um, high school kids she she's you know she just made it her life's mission uh, to pit every single knucklehead you know redneck violent person that she possibly could specifically against me um, so from that moment on, I fought pretty much every single day of my life, going to the bus stop, uh, you know, if I went down to the pond, if I happened to run into a group of guys coming back, uh, you know, switchblades might come out. Um, I remember a kid tried to punch me in the face at school and he had a roll of, of quarters in his hand and I ducked and he almost hit the teacher behind him. And you know what I mean? It was every single goddamn day and in my neighborhood, you know, I was, I was 12, 13 years old, right? So in, in my neighborhood, what would happen is it, since they were all related, if I started to win against a kid my age, his like 30 year old uncle might jump in and put me in a full Nelson and, you know, choke me out or something. Um, so uh, I actually managed to, if you exclude all the times that I got jumped by multiple people, the only fight that I lost uh, was against Dave Brocky, who later would become the lead singer from Guar. Uh, if, if you guys look this up on a map, if you want, uh, Braddock Road and 123 were like the next corner from Pokal Drive, where I lived, and Dave Brocky's house was right on the corner there. And uh, so one day I was walking up the road. He was maybe five seven years older than me or something and the rednecks tammy's brother brothers uh gave him a ride on the back of the truck because he was after me and um he jumped out of the back of the truck with two bricks in his hand 
and pretty much just landed on my back. He was like 210 pounds, probably, you know, 17 years old. He was really overweight back then. And just starts hitting me with the bricks. And um, I didn't uh, I didn't win that particular altercation, but it's noteworthy because he, ended, he was a rock star eventually. Um, so um, this is kind of a bit of a diversion, uh, again, from the... Um, from the inbreds in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. There was a, so something happened with the Taekwondo instructor. Uh, I don't remember what it was. He got in trouble or something. And so we had to look for a new martial arts instructor and just by a stroke of luck, um, probably saved my life. Uh, and this was years before this rumor. Um, so I already had this training by the time all this stuff started to go crazy, but this guy's name was Master Kwan, and he had studied in South Korea in a, uh, Kung Fu monastery, like, I guess, um, like, uh, what are you, what are those guys, the, uh, the monks, I, Shaolin, or, or I, maybe that's, is it the Shaolin monks? Um, and so he didn't speak for 15 years. He just trained and trained and trained and trained. He had like these gigantic scar calluses on his chopping hands. He would drive railroad ties into two by fours, like bam, bam, bam. And then they would, they would be all the way in the, the fucking two by four. Um, and so, oh my God. And he would, he would do these exhibitions. Some of the stuff is on YouTube. You guys can look this guy up. Um, he would do these expeditions where he would put like pins through his body, like through his arms and pull the trucks with all of the students in it. Uh, he, um, he would stand on, uh, like broken glass or eggs on one foot, you know, and not break the eggs or rice paper. And, uh, he would have the pins with the barrels of sand hanging from like his neck flap and his arms and then he would kick something and break it without breaking the eggs or the rice paper. Or I mean this guy was as real as it gets and he had a 10th degree black belt or higher in like 15 different martial arts and so he combined all of these martial arts together, all of the best techniques and he created something called Wardo. So this is like mixed martial arts way before mixed martial arts was a, was a thing. Um, and when I met Quan, he was 65 years old or something, not one gray hair, built like a brick shit house. Um, and actually the most impressive thing that he would do is it, he would be brought into the room blindfolded and there would be like an apple, a cinder block, a soda can, you know, like five objects hanging from the ceiling and he would jump up and explode them all before he hit the ground again, just by sensing where they were with his chi. Um, and so I started going there uh, twice a week to train with this guy. And, um, you know, luckily that started, I think, three or four years before uh, the inbred girl spread the rumor that I said I could beat everyone up. And by the time she spread the rumor, it was true. I mean, I just fucked everybody up. Like I was smashing, breaking kids' noses every couple of days. And <laughs> it was crazy, man. And it was every goddamn day somebody else challenging me because of this crazy redneck idiot. Um, you know, and I actually, I went, uh, I went out on, on, on Facebook and um, God, their parents, when I started winning all these fights, their parents started come like wanting to fight my mom. They would, they would like beat on the door, like, come on out here, you fucking bitch, blah, blah, you know what I mean? Like probably armed, you know, how, how I ever survived all of this is, is beyond me really looking back and thinking about how, you know, how, how I made it through just living in that neighborhood with barely a scratch. What came next was actually probably even more dangerous because I ended up um, leaving home at 17 and going into Washington, D.C., where I ended up um, involved with some pretty serious people. Uh, and actually, before I even got out of junior high school, uh, let's see, no, 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 this was my sophomore year, I guess. Um, 
So remember earlier I was talking about how it was like this really, really bad mixture of like rich kids that wanted to be gangsters that had enough money to buy whatever and were right outside of DC. So we could just go into Washington DC and get whatever we want. Um, and then to make matters even more insanely worse, uh, my one friend who actually ended up in prison for blowing a cop's head off uh, for no reason with a shotgun at a routine traffic stop, um, his dad was a cop and he, um, I think he actually may have fed us a little bit of human one time. Um, this kid wasn't right, man. Uh, I guess we'll get to that story. It's, it's worthy, um, in a certain kind of twisted sense. Um, but so, and this is while I'm still living in this neighborhood. So this is after school. This, I'm going back into this mess, uh, every day. Um, one day Raz gets into his father was a narcotics cop and Raz got, he would take a nap sometimes. Raz got into his briefcase and this was back in the day when they still had floppy disks and, um, you know, hard, hard disks, disks for, you put, you used to put these things in a computer, um, <laughs> So, you know, probably floppy disks or something. And uh, because cops are so brilliant, um, he had written the security codes to the uh, floppy disks on the floppy disks. So Raz pops them in and it's drug dealers' addresses and phone numbers, informants, uh, you know, all of this information, every, what they sell, you know, who their connections were. We knew everything about all of the biggest drug dealers in the Washington DC area. I'm pretty sure he was actually DEA and they lived in like a, you know, $250,000 house, which was kind of a lot of early nineties money, mid nineties money. Um, so suddenly, you know, and we're not stupid kids. Um, I was actually, I mean, pretty smart. So it occurred to me right away. It was like, we can take these, lists of informants and drug dealers and we can go to them and they will give us like huge amounts of money and drugs for this information um and that turned out to be true uh so before all that was done we had a weapons connection in richmond virginia where we could take like i remember one time we, we traded a quarter pound of weed for four grenades from these uh, guys at the armory in Richmond, Virginia, um, that were crackheads. And so they were stealing all of these weapons and selling them to us. I mean, when I was 15 years old, I had a fully automatic Tech 9 in my sock drawer at home. Um, you know, and, and we, were, we, were, we were serious. There was a, an article in the newspaper at one point from my high school that was saying that the teachers had privately met with the principal and said that, you know, I was wondering why I was on the honor roll, right? I didn't turn in homework or take tests or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I did nothing. I all said I'm on the honor roll. And it came out that the teachers were just passing all of the scary kids with good grades because they said they didn't want to get shot. Um, and kids were, kids were getting shot, uh, not in the school uh, like they do it nowadays, but... Um, like I said, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to those stories. So before, before it was all over though, we had this weapons connection in Richmond. Um, we were connected to Farrell Edmonds, uh, in Washington, DC, who, um, when he was busted, he had $500 million in his apartment, like stuffed into the couch, stuffed into the walls. Um, that guy, uh, was the first, when the day we met him was the first time I ever saw someone just, just shot. Like he just casually just shot this dude. Um, cause he was on this list. We handed him the list in the room, uh, with one of the informants. And so he just pulls his gun out of the desk, shoots the dude and like slides us a big pile of cocaine as our payment for this information. And so, um, we also, uh, used Raz's com dad's computer to gain access to a ring of high school teachers at Robinson. All of this stuff you guys can find, 
um, well, it was before the internet, so it might be hard to dig up some of it, but I, I used to actually have the uh, Newsweek where there was a federal cop on the cover and he had acid that was taken from my locker um, fanned out on the cover of Newsweek. Um, and so, but these teachers were making uh, LSD and they had even taught a couple of students at Robinson to do it. So we were connected to an LSD laboratory. Um, we had a hippie mafia connection that was like, I mean, it, it was nuts, you know? And I, I think when all that started, I was 14 or 15 years old. Um, and, you know, I think I'll save all of that whole story uh, for a separate, separate uh, thing because it's just so much, so much happened and it's just so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of stories, man, a lot of stories. And it's, it's crazy when I think about this because this, so we've made it up to like, you know, I'm, I'm 14 or 15 now. Right. And I, I haven't told you, Oh, Oh, the first murder I saw, man, you guys, seriously, if you're squeamish, go away. Like, this is terrible. This is going to be one of the worst things that you have ever heard in your entire life. Um, but something that I left out of all of this is that my father, who wasn't really my father, my parents told me when I was 11 years old that my father was actually this other guy, and my father, who I was raised to believe was my father, wasn't actually my father. Uh, and so you want to talk about having trust issues with women after some shit like that, right? So, um, so... Oh my god, where the hell were we? I just, I just totally lost my, uh... Oh yeah, the first murder. Um, I was um, shit seven years old, maybe seven or eight years old, I guess. Uh, I can remember that uh, Janet Jackson was playing. So late eighties, probably early nineties. And there was, they were, they were bikers, right? Uh, Hell's Angels, Pagans, um, and uh, so there was Ted Nye uh, there. He had a fuck you tattooed across his um, eyebrow. Uh, he was an enforcer for the Pagans, I think. Um, I remember they used to make PCP in his backyard in these big barrels um, that they had to change regularly because the PCP materials would eat through these steel <laughs> barrels. Like, you know, every couple of months they had to, um, they had to swap them out. And so, you know, Ted was one of the worst, man. He was, he was, he, as a kid, I can remember, I was terrified of these people as a little kid, you know, all my dad's friends, these giant murderous bikers. They were always high as hell. I mean, I got, I got caught up in raids. Just we'd be driving on the road, and all of a sudden we'd be surrounded by cops. They'd yank me out of the car along with everyone else. Nine years old, put a Doberman and a shotgun on my head. Like, you know what I mean? It was like. Uh, so, anyways, Ted and I is one that stands out. When they demolished his house, um, they actually found a bunch of bodies underneath of it. Um, so, uh, so this party. Um, Everything's as calm as, you know, and, and jovial as it can be with a bunch of murderous biker gang type people. Um, you know, barbecue, people are, people are eating and listening to music. And um, I see this girl, she had a ponytail, uh, jean jacket, um, walk over and hug this guy. And... Um, <clears throat> and this other guy sees it from across the parking lot and um, he comes across the parking lot, grabs the girl by the ponytail, opens her mouth, puts it on the curb, stomps on the back of her head, kills her dead. And it turned out that um, it was a long lost cousin um, that she hadn't seen in a number of years. Uh, and that's why she hugged him, but got her killed. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, 
That definitely, um, I'm actually surprised how difficult it was to talk about that. Um, maybe, it, maybe it's because it was one of the really early ones. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, that was the type of thing that would happen around these types of people. Not usually quite so that, you know, that was a particularly gruesome um, instance of that sort of thing. And you know, I know I'm missing, I'm missing some, um, there was a serial killer in the neighborhood that almost got me. Uh, that guy, I'll never forget this shit, man. He killed two of my friends, these two sisters. Uh, this happened actually in Spotsylvania, Virginia, um, after we'd moved out of this neighborhood, but it was the first place we went um, after this Pokal Drive. Uh, and I thought I had escaped the nightmare. And so these two girls go missing um, and I ran away from home and I was walking down the street and this guy's like, hey, come here. And I go over to the window of his car and um, he's got a broken arm. And he's like, hey, you wanna go somewhere with me and try a little sex? And I was like, well, you, you got a sister or something? And uh, he's like, no, with me. And I was like, no, man, I don't get down like that. And he, uh, he's like, all right. And then he straightened the broken arm out, the cast thing, like, it wasn't really a cast. It was just like a, you know, you put him support thing, straightened his arm out, drives away. I only found out that that was the guy that killed the two girls because he got caught three years ago or something. And it was on, I found it on the internet that, um, that guy was, uh, again, that's kind of unrelated, but that was also just, you know, one of those things that's up there on my list or scale, you know, Richter scale of horrendous shit that I saw as a kid. Um, so there you have it, folks. You know, that's just a little bit of it, really. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on um, with these stories. Do me a favor too: hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. Um, if you ever can watch one of my videos again after this, uh, we are demonetized, so we don't get any, uh, money from YouTube, um, for telling you these horrifying stories. Uh, <laughs> we really do appreciate the support. And in fact, uh, last time I, I jumped on here, I, um, I was talking about, um, how I wanted to get back into metaphysics. And then somehow I ended up talking about the inbred murderers of Pokal Drive and all of this associated um, stuff, you know. I'm not really sure why I felt compelled to do it. My partner actually suggested this a long time ago, but she was, I think, thinking more about the, you know, drug dealer stuff in my late teens in Washington, D.C. Which, you know, it is interesting. I know a lot of stuff about some elite people. Um, Ted Cruz is uh, one of them. Um, and that, that was a whole, a whole nother saga. Um, so, you know, there's like these periods, the early redneck white trash thing. And then I sort of evolved into more sophisticated organized crime really um we weren't like street level thug gangster kids we were really really highly intelligent um organized um extremely scary don't get me wrong um and then from there i left and actually went into the city in washington dc where i just took things up a whole nother level um, and then, you know, and the whole time, you guys, this, this, the Illuminostic that you know and love, uh, with the, you know, the, all the psychedelics and the obsession with the metaphysics and all this, that was going on through all of this. You know, it's like when I didn't have to, you know, when I wasn't in a knife fight in my driveway, literally they would come into my driveway and attack me. Like I, I would be in the backyard like almost in a meditative trance, like wondering where the universe came from. I remember I used to spend a lot of time on our front porch, just like staring off into the trees, just thinking about, you know, how it was possible that people could be, you know, content to just work and shit and breed and die 
and that they didn't seem to ask these big, I mean, I'm talking when I'm like six years old even, you know, really, really young, but through all of this, you know, after I, I get into the, the, the brawl with seven inbred redneck kids, I would literally come home and read Aldous Huxley and Timothy Leary and, you know, um, it's, I just, I had no choice, you know, I, I had no choice. And, and fundamentally, I was a very gentle, sweet, shy, heavily, severely damaged, you know, my mom was insane and, and had been severely traumatized, um, sexually, uh, sexual abuse and, um, and you know, there was a lot of, I mean, you've heard the stories, <laughs> some of them, um, you know, but I, I, I was this weird little metaphysical, gentle, I just had to do double duty, um, in order to survive. Uh, and I was a target, uh, f for the rich kids because my family was poor and I couldn't dress like them. And, um, you know, they did single me out and, and, and also I wasn't Christian. So even the redneck kids that, that weren't part of my neighborhood, um, they also would, you know, jump me because just because I didn't believe in Jesus, I was a devil worshiper and all of this stuff. Um, you know, so I was all the way an outcast, no matter what group you're talking about. There was only me. It's not like there were other misfit kids of the same type or something around. Um, really, uh, really pretty, pretty incredible. And, you know, it's, a, it's important when we're healing from this. My, my situation is kind of extreme. You know what I mean? I've never even heard anyone talk about things like you know, most people never witnessed anything like the things I saw every day, even once in their life, I don't think. It doesn't seem that way to me. Um, but you have to try to take the, the, the silver lining, uh, you know, and I, I do appreciate the fact that it, it made me extremely brave, I guess. Um, I'm not, you know, it's very difficult to scare me. Um, you know, and it has put me in a position to where I have been able to protect people in a lot of situations because we live in a world where, you know, guys don't know how to fight there. Nobody, nobody knows what to do with a gun, it, you know, in like upper middle class Colorado, where I ended up living or later in, in Northern California, kids would, uh, get into growing pot and they had no clue what they were getting into, you know? Um, so for example, on one occasion I was working on a mountain in Northern California and there's all these guys from, um, Northern Spain and, uh, the, the, they're so macho. They had like leather, you know, uh, bracelets on and they're all muscly and acting all manly all the time. And the guy got accused of ripping his partner off that was growing the weed on the mountain. And this Marine, the crazy tweaking Marine shows up with a gun and rips his shirt off and he's trying to scare everyone. And, um, I jumped in my car, my Beamer and pointed it at him. And I figured if he shoots, uh, you know, he's going to hit the engine block as long as if I, I duck down and I just gunned it at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and everyone else is like hiding under tables. Uh, I, you know what I mean? I, and so I, I'm, I'm thankful when situations come up where, you know, there needs to be somebody that can fulfill that role that I can actually do that without hesitation. Um, that's kind of the, um, that's how I, 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 I try to make sense of it. <laughs> You know, that uh, if we truly are living in the end times or, you know, the, the civilization is going to collapse. Um, I know that a lot of the other people that have developed their consciousness and are, you know, trying to live a spiritually aware existence um, don't have the kind of background that I do. Uh, and that comes in extremely useful when there's a problem and nobody else has a clue how to deal with it. Um, Uh, therapy? Yeah, I mean, psychedelics, you know, and one thing that I left out from this is that uh, these experiences and this early trauma and all of that kind of stuff, um, 
did leave me where I was definitely violent when it was not appropriate as well. It's not like I was always just this like gentle superhero running around, you know, defending the weak. Um, I was, you know, in, in order to rise to the top of that kind of a shit pile, you have to be really, really scary. And I think there's, there's a point where even though I wanted to be peaceful and I wanted to be kind and gentle, it's just really, really difficult to take things to that much of an extreme and still to be able to just turn that switch on and off. Um, so, you know, a lot of people suffered unjustly and unnecessarily at my hands. Uh, I definitely, um, definitely there were, there were periods in my life where I sort of gravitated to the, you know, dangerous psycho ego kind of, um, into the spectrum. Um, and it was really weird, you know, it, it really looking back on all of it, it, I've just from analyzing myself, I've learned a lot about how people can be such contradictory creatures because I was always like reaching for these deeper metaphysical truths and I wanted peace on earth and I was out to save the world, but you could just maybe accidentally flip my switch and just hit that button. It's like nothing. Watch me turn into a psycho all of a sudden. Um, and also I think the damage from, you know, my parents physically assaulting each other all the time and my, you know, my mom choking my dad, my dad choking my mom and beating her in the face. I mean, it was all kinds of violence of all sorts. So it took me years and years and years and years and years to stop trying to be intimidating. Like when I left Virginia and I went up into the Colorado Rockies to like get away from all of this. Like I literally was being hunted by murderous drug dealers for one thing. I mean, I wanted to go out West my whole life anyways. You know, I, I think I was like seven years old and I was listening to the doors and Jim Morrison saying, uh, the West is the best get here and we'll do the rest. And I knew that he was telling the truth. You know what I mean? I was like, California obviously is where there are other people like me, you know, because I'm like, alone running around with these Timothy Leary books trying to like find rednecks that'll listen to me or you know what I mean like I knew that I, I where I needed to go um but it took me years and years and years and uh, a prison sentence to really thoroughly decondition all of the anger issues and just I think the coping mechanism of carrying myself like I was you know dangerous trying to communicate that to people and and even after I had worked all the actual violence out of my system uh, with mushrooms, I guess I didn't say how I did that, right? But it mostly psychedelics. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big advocate of psychedelics and magic mushrooms and all of these things. If it wasn't for these compounds, I don't know that I ever would have found my way out of that. Um, I probably almost definitely would be in prison for having killed someone or God only knows. Um, you know, I, I really... Uh, I, I did have a line that I could be pushed over and then I was probably capable of anything. And I was in very much intentionally like that. Um, but so yeah, I, I had to really intentionally reprogram and analyze and work through all of my insecurities. And I remember friends of mine in Colorado, like way after I had worked through the worst of it, um, they would tell me, you know, like, man, you really like the way you carry yourself is like really intimidating to people. Like you're, you're scary, you know? And I was not, you know, in my head at that point, I had convinced myself that I was just like this happy go lucky hippie type. Like, you know, I had dreadlocks at one point and I was always wearing grateful dead shirts. And I thought I was just, you know, friendly, uh, but the people would tell me, you know, like, you're actually, like, legitimately frightening. Like, not not because I would do any, you know what I mean? I didn't have to. I, I was just the way that I carried myself. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I've had to go through my entire being and rearrange and reconfigure all of the damage that was done from witnessing all of this violence. And um, 
And then also, you know, you carry around a lot of guilt uh, because there are a lot of people that were um, damaged, you know, along the way. Um, it, it, and, you, you know, you have to come to terms with that because it is, when, when you have that kind of trauma, it's kind of like being two people at, at once. Um, and especially in my case, it was just so extreme because I was angel and demon. And, you know, at, at the worst period of it, probably between when I was 17 and 23 or 20, 23 or something, between 17 and 23, um, you know, you just... It's, it's difficult to even, uh, you know, I could not, I couldn't even predict my own behavior, um, you know, for a number of years. And, and it was nightmarish because I had a conscious and I had, you know, I wanted to be a peaceful, you know, kind. And I was, you know, I was totally generous and I was totally kind to strangers. For You know what I mean? I would go out of my way to help people and stuff, but hit the wrong button and, you know, things would happen. Um, so, yeah, you know, and that's one of the things I think that keeps people trapped also in that type of trauma where other people are affected is that the guilt, you know, when you lose control, something happens and then you have this guilt and it sort of drives you further into this perception of yourself. Um, and so it sort of keeps you trapped in a, in a cycle that's very difficult um, to to escape and uh you know probably what helped me more than anything um was magic mushrooms that what i noticed um <clears throat> when i really started sort of digging my way out of this kind of gangster mentality that had somehow uh, like intertwined itself with my being against my will i guess is kind of how it felt um when I started to loosen that up, you know, I could, every time I ate mushrooms for a while, I could, I could tell I had like measurably pushed out of the shadow and shed some of this stuff. Um, and I remember thinking even way back then how remarkable it was, how profound a single experience with, uh, these compounds could be and, uh, you know, how much progress you could make in five hours. Um, So yeah, but no, aside from that, you know, the only, the only kind of therapy that I've had is my own analysis of myself, um, and psychedelics. That's, that's it, you know, um, and I, I, I feel like that for, for my own personal path, uh, it was important that I didn't seek help. And I know a lot of people would roll their eyes hearing that, <laughs> um, but it was important that I did it myself. And that is one of the prerequisites, you know, that, that Terrence McKenna gave for, uh, you know, becoming a shaman. A shaman is a person who has either gone mad or become so ill that they've almost crossed over. But it, it, in my case, the, you know, the, the applicable version of it is that they have gone mad and had to fix themselves and it's through this process of reassembling um the uh psyche um that you're able that you learn how to do it for other people um and i think that the people that have gone through that process and have actually been effective at it um are going to be much more effective as, you know, healers and sort of playing the role of psychotherapist or, um, you know, a, a, a real uh, psychologist, um, I think, needs to have gone through this, this process. You know, Carl Jung, um, I think, is one of the great minds of psychology 
And it's really obvious if you look at his uh, life path that there, he went through that period that people call piercing the veil that's followed by a dark night of the soul and the crossing of the abyss, right? And these are all phases of the initiatory process um, that, that happens when people take initiation in the mysteries or uh, when <clears throat> um, you receive solar initiation. I believe that's a real thing. Uh, it's mentioned in Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, the Freemason, when he says that, you know, a lot of Masons actually have never entered a temple and they receive their um, initiation on a ray of light. Um, but the, the common denominator is that no matter whether you're talking about a shaman in the jungles of South America or someone who has taken initiation in the rites of Isis or uh, uh, the mysteries of, uh, you know, the Eleusinian mysteries or whatever it is, there's this process that happens. And it is these processes and the changes that they catalyze that trains the individual to sort of guide the people that come in the lower uh, ranks. You know, if we're talking about the hermetic secret societies, for example, or mystery schools, when things are done properly, um, the person that is above, you know, your position uh, has successfully navigated certain internal processes that have been deliberately catalyzed. Um, and that's really what the, the chain of initiation, um, uh, the succession, uh, is that really about real true initiation and you know I I think that this type of modality of, of healing um, and even just to have people that are undergoing these processes present in our society again is you know the path forward uh, for humanity um, I, I think that you know Timothy Leary noticed back in the 60s 50s even that the format, the protocol, um, the, the, the methodology of, of psychology was not really an effective method of healing. It was more that it was designed um, as an adjunct to, to psychiatry so that there could be um, this uh, sort of, it's like a, like a, pro, a, a funnel, like a click funnel almost, where you, you're funneling people into diagnosis that results in prescriptions that are only intended to treat uh, symptoms and not to cure, right? And what Leary saw when the psychedelics came along is a way to actually get deep into the psyche and to help people to actually restructure it in a meaningful and lasting way. And um, <clears throat> obviously he was correct. So uh, it's a very long-winded way of saying that, you know, I... I think for myself, it was really important that I did it myself. Um, that, that doesn't mean that that's the best thing for everyone. Um, and it also sort of makes me feel like I was being groomed by the universe um, for the role that I would eventually play because um, <clears throat> my interest in the mysteries as a small child, really, you know, at 10 or 11, I started reading Huxley and Joseph Campbell and, and got into the mysteries. Uh, you know, that lead, led me to reading Jung and Leary and all of this stuff really young. And then, you know, more mainstream uh, psychotherapy uh, manuals and, and whatnot. And so, <clears throat> you know, I was cultivating this skill set, uh, even as a, a kid, um, that would eventually intersect with um, the psychedelics. And, um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of ways to think about it. You, you could say that perhaps intuitively... I just kind of sensed that I was going to need these tools later on down the road because I must have known that, you know, my family life and the, the environment that I was in, um, it was that the effects of it were going to have to be addressed at some point. So, um... I've been talking for quite a while and it was pretty emotionally stressful. Um, do me a favor, uh, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. We are demonetized. So um, the only support we get comes from our community out there in YouTube land. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything, uh, you know, I didn't get to talk about how Dave Grohl from Nirvana came into the 
uh, 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 <coughs> equation. Um, it's it, an insane story, um, just like all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, I, I'll explain that a little bit um, as my like ending, because if I do another one of these, I'm gonna pick up in like junior high school when I really started to, you know, say things to cops like be careful little piggy or I'll huff and puff and blow your head off and I, and I, I wasn't kidding <laughs> you know um, that that period uh, junior high school and high school where I was really started to get gangster um, and then all the Washington DC outlaw escapades and then from there off to Northern California and the outlaw pot scene which was a just as bad as all the rest of these stories, you know, some of them were amazing and, and, and positive too, you know, it wasn't all, um, it wasn't all, uh, scary and violent. <laughs> there was an awful lot of that. Um, but okay. So, so Dave Grohl, I mentioned that I was in Fairfax County, right? Um, Dave Grohl from Nirvana, Foo Fighters. I think he was in Queens of the Stone Age. I, I've literally never heard them before, but I'm, I think he was in that band as well. Um, so, uh, oh man, I was probably like eight, I guess, uh, pretty young. My dad had a townhouse on um, Zion Drive and um, there were these bands, these punk rock bands that would come and practice there and people, it was also a cocaine house. So there was drugs around and that's why all these bands were coming through when they came through Washington DC. Uh, and my dad was like renting one of the rooms upstairs. And then there was the basement where, uh, there was a couch and there was a drum kit. The drum kit belonged to a biker named David nicely who died of cancer. God rest his soul a couple of years ago in Florida. And so he had his drum kit there. And there was this skinny young kid uh, with a long black ponytail. He always had it tied back. Um, I had no idea who he was. I didn't care. I was a little kid. I liked him because he had a squirrel. He had a little baby squirrel named Sid Vicious um, for a while. He crawled into a big bag of cocaine and ate a bunch and died. Um, but um, So um, that long haired skinny kid turned out to be Dave Grohl from Nirvana. And um, one day uh, he, was, he was sleeping on the couch and I was playing Nintendo. Might've been Super Nintendo by that point, but maybe Nintendo. Uh, and um, the other drummer came storming down the stairs and I guess Grohl had been playing his drum kit a week or so prior and he broke a, a tom or something, cracked a tom and he didn't have any money to pay for it. He was in a band called Scream at the time. Um, my, my birth name is Harley and actually the guitarist from that band, his name is Harley as well. I remember thinking that was cool, you know, this black guy's in this band with this guy. I was learning to play guitar already and you know, it's like Harley who's in a semi-successful band that was touring Europe and they were called Scream. Um, and, you know, guys from Diamond Head used to come over there. You know, Metallica covered one of their songs. Uh, I got something to say. I killed your mother today. And worse, it's a really terrible song in terms of the lyrical content. Uh, Diamond Head would come over. Guys from the Sex Pistols and the Misfits would come by sometimes because Scream would tour with people like that, you know. Um, so uh, who's the guy, the guy that with the uh, long black widow's peak and he's always wearing spiky. That guy was around sometimes. He's probably the most famous, the group from the Misfits. Um, anyways, so the guy that owned the drum kit comes and Grohl is asleep on the couch and he grabs him by the collar and just because he told him, if you can't pay for my drums don't play them if you can't break them. And you know, now of course, David Grohl is known as one of the loudest, most powerful drummers ever. Um, so, you know, stories consistent with people know of David Grohl. And so he, he, he grabs him and he says, you have the money to pay for that symbol? Cause he cracked a symbol. He played it again. He broke a symbol. He's like, you got the money to pay for that symbol. And, and Grohl's like, no, no, man, I'm sorry. And he drags him up the stairs. And so of course I pause my game. I remember stopping to pause the game, right? Not going to lose my place in the game and chase them upstairs. And by the time I got upstairs, he had Grohl in the ground. He was beating him senseless. And so 
years go by, Kurt Cobain is dead. Um, uh, Grohl's mom was my English teacher for like two weeks in, in, in ninth grade, uh, but she had to quit because they got real, Nirvana blew up and she couldn't teach a class because the kids wouldn't shut up about Nirvana. Um, so she was my teacher for like a month or two and she had to just quit. Uh, and so all those years, I never thought about that kid again, never saw him again. He never came back to that house, you know? Um, and so one day we're at my dad's mom's house and we're watching MTV unplugged. Um, and it's the Nirvana one. And it was after Kurt Cobain had, had, had died. I don't think he killed himself. But my dad suddenly his jaw drops and he's like, is that kid's name David? And I was like, yes. And he's like, Dave Grohl. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, don't you remember when nicely beat the fucking shit out of him in the front yard? And I was like, oh my God. So um, that's the Dave Grohl story that I kind of touched on and then glossed over. True story though, um, saw him get the crap beat out of him in my front yard. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's, um, that's that for the early years of Illuminostic. Um, I, I apologize to anyone that was traumatized uh, by these stories, um, but I, you know, I put it in the description, it's, 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 it's ugly, man, and I, I'm sure I left some murders and stuff out, but, you know, you guys don't really need to hear everything, I guess. I mean, um, <clears throat> really the big takeaway from all this is just the, the power of psychedelics to, uh, you know, to reverse all of that kind of damage, you know, and I, I'm not saying that I'm totally normal. I, my emotional um, response range is not, is, is not very... <laughs> nothing um you know that, there are definitely still things that 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 pop up you know um if people show any sign of being untrustworthy uh i can be you know i'll make a lot more out of it than maybe is appropriate because you know for most of my half of my life uh if i saw any sign of sketchiness someone might be an undercover they might be plotting something, um, you know what I mean? So I, I know that I'm still a little bit paranoid when people show any of the signs of being untrustworthy or something, I, you know? So it's, it's not like I have totally, totally fixed everything, but if you consider the extent of all of it, um, I, you know, I, I think it, it speaks to volumes um, as to you know, the power of psychedelic medicine to help people to heal. And then also our ability to um, turn that into positive uh, energy and uh, healing for other people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys have questions or anything, I'll hang out for a few more minutes. Um, yeah, well, you know, Cleric, the medicine is increasingly available. I think that um, it's it's unfortunate what just happened in California because they were trying to legalize all psychedelics in all quantities, including manufacturing uh, and growing, not just plants, though. Like, you could set up an LSD laboratory. And the thing is, you guys, you know, the one of the, when I do another biographical video like this and we get into the outlaw pot thing, man, the war with the federal government and the people of California, uh, uh, north of San Francisco, uh, you know, most normal Americans, people that haven't seen it with their own eyes, I don't think could believe it, that this had been happening in the United States for as many years as it did for decades. I mean, I've known people who are like third generation pot farmers that, you know, they've never had a job at 40 years old their parents never had a job. Their grandparents might have had a job before they came to Northern California. Um, you know, and it's such a complete reversal of what normal America is. You know, like, for example, I've seen a grown man break down in tears because he had to get a job. Um, and not because he's lazy. And it, it, it's not that. It's just that you have so much pride in your outlaw, you know, your sovereignty and your um, autonomy um, and to have a, an inferior crop 
uh, and not to be able to grow enough weed to make it through the, the next season without getting a job was like humiliating. And he wasn't like sobbing, you know what I mean? But when he told me like, yeah, I had to get a job, like I could tell his eyes were like welling up, like he was so frustrated. And some of it is of course, thinking about whatever happened to his crop, I'm sure. But you know what I mean? Like it's the opposite. It's like, like you're embarrassed if you have to have a job because you're not outlaw enough, you know? Um, and it's, yeah, it was, it was really a, a remarkable thing, um, to be a part of and to see, uh, uh, f I, I was, I was there for like the tail end of it before, um, before they legalized and destroyed it. Basically the last true stronghold of free people in the United States were crushed by legalization. You know, and it's funny when it happened, I, I said, here comes a new world order. Like, you know, the, of course, all of the, you know, middle-class liberals that trust the government were like, yay, pot's getting more legalized, and they didn't let anyone out of jail. You know what I mean? And all that it did was make it so that mom and pop growers got crushed, and corporations like Monsanto started buying up Mendocino County. Um, but what I was getting at there is it's going to be, it's going to happen, I think, hopefully. I'm hoping to be there to join the battle on the ground, right? Um, but it's going to be, I think, like uh, the pot thing was, because it was legal on a state level. It was legal on the county level, right? I had a doctor that would just, I mean, he oftentimes wouldn't even tell you um, what was, ask what was wrong with you. You would just go in there and he would prescribe you 99 pot plants. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which in, in Northern California outdoors is like, it could be hundreds of pounds, like 500 pounds. If you really, you know, more really, I mean, 10 pound plants, um, max, more or less max, you know, but the point is that the feds would still come after you. So, you know, it's, it's not like it was really safe or something. Um, and I think that something like that is going to happen if they legalize just blanket legalize production possession and that's what this bill how it was structured right no limits no limits on quantities no limits on production so you're going to have lsd chemists and you know people growing huge crazy amounts of mushrooms and the feds so but once again it's going to create these communities of outlaws um and basically the old uh pot industry of outlaws is going to be replaced by this psychedelic, uh, which I think is a huge upgrade is, and I can't wait to be a part of it. Um, and all of the nightmare shit that'll come with it, uh, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's worth it. I think, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about that to see the, the progress that's being made, um, with, you know, the acceptance of psychedelic medicine. And I'm also really excited to see that there are at least places in, in California where they're not in a big hurry to allow it to be regulated. They're not, you know, to have uh, big pharma take control of psychedelic medicine and, 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 and create analogs that don't have a psych psychedelic experience, for example, which is gonna destroy the efficacy to some extent, right? that experience is part of what makes them work. Um, you know, but that's not the road to go down. What we need is absolute individual sovereignty. You know, like the Comte de Phoenix said in the early 1800s, the absolute rule of the state can only be a function of the absolute liberty of the individual. Right? That's the only way that can happen. And the only way that citizens can have that kind of autonomy is if they have achieved a certain level of consciousness. And that's what Gnosis does for people. That's what happens when psychedelics are properly applied. Because, you know, I've never been, you know, when I talk about my past and the rough spots where I affected other people, it wasn't that I was a thief or anything like that. It's just that I was really volatile. And, um, but you know, even even given all of that, um, the ultimate consequence of psychedelics is that I reached a place where 
I will not harm you unless you force me to, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I'll do anything I can to help you without getting in my own way, right? I'll even go out of my way to some extent, depending on the circumstances. And I, I think that once, you know, people's traumas are uh, dissolved and egos are in their proper balance and, you know, the sort of reorientation of consciousness occurs that is the product of, uh, you know, initiatory experiences. So study of the mysteries and consciousness and the natural sciences um, combined with the kind of uh, liberation of consciousness that happens with psychedelics, it is possible to actually have that kind of autonomy with individuals. That there are people that can be trusted um, that do not need to be governed and will not tolerate being governed. Uh, and, I, you know, it's we we have to realize that as, as outlandish as that sounds or utopian, um, I think the reality is that we have to very rapidly get a majority to that place, to that state, or we're totally fucked. And there's no middle ground. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's, you know what I mean? That is what we are confronted with. And there is the possibility of failure, you know? Um, I'm not here to sell uh, fairy dust and unicorn farts. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, I, it is definitely possible. And we have the tools and we certainly have the motivation. So. All right, 10 o'clock, you guys. I still have COVID. I'm losing my voice. But thank you all so much for spending this time with me. I really do appreciate it. I hope that it's, you know, somehow useful um, in your lives. Uh, by the way, we're still having our retreats here. Um, if you're interested in hermetic ritual magic or ayahuasca, San Pedro, Changa, um, and the Amazon rainforest, we do a lot of excursions out to see squirrel monkeys and top ears. And uh, there was a pipe snake in the house last night. It was beautiful. Orange, um, harmless, black, like, like stripes, almost like tigers, look like a tiger kind of, um, pretty surreal. Uh, and it, you know, it's just the Amazon. If you've never seen the Amazon, whether you come here or not, you need to go see the Amazon. Um, you need to help us save the Amazon. Um, it really is getting torn to the ground and it's not good. I'm pretty sure we're all going to die if they're successful in destroying it. So don't let that happen. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing that until the end of October. Um, we are going to talk to a guy about this amazing property we may move. Um, he's initiating it. Uh, we gave up because it was too much money. Um, but there are waterfalls on the property, caves, caverns, uh, parrots, um, cacao farm. There's tilapia farms. So there's fish being produced by the thousands. I, it could weather the apocalypse. And um, there's even like this big giant flat stone with a, a ball, spherical stone set on it no one knows what the hell it is or where it came from uh and we're told that if you drink ayahuasca you can feel the sphere vibrating um you know it's it's a remarkable place so tomorrow we're going to loha to talk to this guy and see what it is that he's gonna propose um so uh it's looking like it's possible that if you guys do come we'd be out at that property which would be even this property is fine it's good it's great you know there's the river backyard plenty of hiking in the jungle and everything but this other property is is way better i mean it's crystal clear gorgeous river right in the front yard and hot springs and just everything you can imagine um all the features that you can find in the amazon rainforest um which which is cool because then we don't have to get in it here you know when we go to the waterfalls and stuff we have to take a taxi so you kind of have to break your seclusion uh in order to go see a lot of the monkeys and you know what i mean um and at this property everything's there so you, we, we're totally self-contained um so if you're an investor too um there this might be something for you uh to talk to us about so shoot us an email if you're interested in the retreats and uh, again thank you guys so much for spending this time with me hit the like button share subscribe support us on patreon we are demonetized we get no money so we need your support uh there are one-time options uh for supporting at the top of the chat 
and uh, we'll see you again probably tomorrow night to talk about, oh man, I had a really good subject in mind. Um, basically how it is that, that magic in the form of the influence of consciousness on energy, how you can actually see um, the effects of that in our, well, just join me tomorrow and I will explain much more coherently than I'm going to now. I'm going to go eat some dinner and good night.